Can I just pick a glass here? Yeah? Great, well, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I tried to read up on blockchains, and um, I'm afraid I, I got to this when Civil 2 attacked Civil 1 or something like that, and then I, I had to stop. So I'm afraid I can't, uh, I don't think I can tell you very much how basic income and the blockchain will work or won't work. Um, so this is going to be very much. Um, I'm not going to talk about money basically at all, and it's uh, it's not really my expertise. Um, so how does you're on full screen? If you're pressing uh, page down, we should go to the next page. Ah, perfect. If you just uh, um, if you can do the one where I can just change yeah, the slides. Sorry, I'm confused by the difference. In I know. Yeah. I Ah, page down. Page up. Okay, so the top, these, just these two? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so here are the main arguments for the basic income. <laughs> um, and now you're probably not the audience that needs to be convinced that it's actually a, a serious policy proposal, um, of which I'm, I'm convinced also. Um, maybe you're the audience which needs to be convinced, as I am also convinced, that it's it's not a panacea, so it's not the, the goddess of, of universal redemption. It, it has problems, and it doesn't solve all problems. Um, so that's, that's going to be uh, the plan. I'm going to basically consider some often repeated or the main sort of motivations which, which I've come across, which is, again, not, not necessarily all the literature, um, <clears throat> which will sort of lead us to labor economics questions, which is probably the, the area I know most on. Um, and then to the question, you know, what does it cost? How are we going to finance it? And, and I guess the, the, the monetary ideas that, that, that you put forward are, are, one, are one way of, of, of dealing with that. But I think there's some sort of real questions as well. And the real questions are then also lead to the question of, of fairness, of, of distribution of resources, basically. Um, so that's the plan, and then it's, it's, I hope it's going to be fairly short so we can get, uh, get an opportunity to discuss largely. So I'm, I'm planning with half an hour or so. But uh, I can try and keep track of time. No, I can't. Um, okay, good. So you all know what it is. Um, here are sort of standard criteria. Paid by the state on an individual basis. This is not quite... Um, yeah, this is quite important given that in Germany, for example, taxation is household based. So um, it, it's relevant whether you're paying it to a household or to an individual. Um, and obviously, unconditional is the key sort of hallmark. Um, and in particular, no means testing and no work search requirement. These are the two sort of standard uh, conditions which are attached to most welfare programs uh, worldwide. So that's, that's what we're talking about. I'm not going to talk about a specific proposal as in 1,000 euros or 800 euros. The points I'm making are slightly more general um, and less specific. Uh, I haven't got any numbers. I'm afraid I can't uh, provide you with how much it would cost in Germany. I'm going to try and, uh, uh, try and argue that it's, going to, it's extremely difficult to come up with any figure. Actually, I think it, it's not, very, it's not uh, possible to give a figure of how much it would cost, because that's assuming that things stay the same, whereas what, we, what the proponents of the scheme want is that things change. And then the question is, how much do people change, and how do they, how do they adapt? Um, OK, so here are some standard motivations, which, which I think are particularly relevant. So there's uh, poverty in lots of areas. You mentioned uh, Kenya <coughs> and the US as well, but also in Germany. Um, especially among, among pensioners. There's a big debate at the moment. Old age poverty in Germany is a, is a problem, especially uh, women, especially when they separated and they, they didn't contribute much to the social security system. Um, redistribution is a slightly different aspect, uh, where again, there's arguments why redistribution might be a good thing for everyone, for the whole economy. Um, <clears throat> this is, I guess, the sort of Traditionally, the most important argument, which is 
you know, non all sorts of non-market activities. Economists then like to consider that it's efficient in, in senses which we see, um, which brings us to the fact that maybe some unemployment is inefficient and maybe um, uh, an unconditional basic income can, can reduce unemployment. And then uh, there's also the aspect that given how the labor market works, it might reduce wages, which is not necessarily a motivation for us here, but maybe a motivation for some people, some of the opponents on, on the right, some conservative uh, individuals who've also been arguing for the unconditional basic income. And that also maybe helps us explain why this proposal has had proponents across the political spectrum. So um, poverty. Um, the money reduces poverty, duh, right? <laughs> but what's, uh, what's important for the, what's the advantage of, the, of UBI is that benefit, benefit uptake is often a problem for schemes. So I mentioned old age um, poverty in Germany. Many old people do not go to the state and seek help, although they are entitled to it. In the US, this is a large uh, problem for disenfranchised parts of the population, they don't go and seek welfare benefits that they are entitled to. They might not even know that they are entitled to these benefits. Stigma is an issue. You might not want to have it. You might be proud that you're independent, that you don't need it. Uh, and obviously, there's a cost attached to showing that you fulfill these conditions. Uh, and so, so more than just the redistribution aspect, it's the fact that UBI, by being extremely simple and by having less stigma because everyone gets it might be able to reach more people um, so the conditions always create uncertainty are you you know are you fulfilling the conditions will you get the money or not and I actually I think this is quite a big potentially this is a big issue right I, I think potentially people are in Germany for example the whole uh, discussion about the sanctions attached to not uh, fulfilling the you know, job search requirements um, creates a lot of anxiety, I think, for lots of people. Condition, you, know, you can have higher payments because you spend less on administration. You all know this. So uh, there's some additional arguments for the unconditional aspects over and above just giving people money. Uh, there's been a recent debate about um, the central banks not being able to do anything. This is actually my only point concerning money. Um, so there's been a recent debate about what can the central bank do after raising interest rates to zero, uh, quantitative easing, basically buying all the assets of European companies, uh, you know, increasing housing prices like mad. So now the newest idea is giving everyone money. Um, and so the unconditional basic income would be a different way maybe of doing that. But obviously, the idea of helicopter money is being discussed as a, as a one-off uh, sort of stimulus package. Actually, when I was in France, I got a, I got a, the government just transferred me, I don't know, 500 euros or so as a stimulus. So that was, yeah, after the crisis, sometime in 2009 or so when I lived there, it was quite, a, quite astonishing. Um, that was just before the sovereign debt crisis. Um, so, support for non-market activities. I'm going to try and go a little bit quick because I think you know all this, right? Alternative forms of work, right? Non-market non activity. Care work, there's a strong feminist case given that lots of the care work is done by women um, and is not, is not remunerated. You know, art curiosity, there's the entrepreneur argument which you mentioned in Kenya as well, um, altruism, civic engagement. So these are all things then where currently there's systems for paying people. So for example, care work, if you're in the social security system and you contributed, you can take leave and it's, uh, it's paid for, but you have to sort of be in the system. And all these other points, we, there's lots of organizations which pay people to do this, but the UBI would be a way of doing it which might give more people access and which again might save on the administration of the systems which condition these payments. So we don't need the 
we need less of the structures which will then distribute the money to the right people doing the right things. Um, now, economics. So I wrote, reduce wasteful behavior and bureaucracy. Uh, I'm not saying that bureaucracy is wasteful. I think lots of bureaucracy is very uh, sensible. But what economists like about UBI is that people go to a lot of pains to try and uh, fulfill the conditions. Uh, and this, some of this is sort of rent-seeking behavior, right? Where you're not actually producing anything, but you're just, you're just trying to get more of the share of the pie which is there, right? So if I spend my afternoon trying to fill in forms for the uh, job center, whatever it's called in Germany, um, if I try and transfer my assets to my family, friends, whoever, because I'm not allowed to have the assets because it's means tested, if I uh, try and get a job but on the black market because I'm not allowed to have a job because I'm on benefits, all this behavior potentially is, is a lot of work. And this work I could have put into something productive. right? So it's not saying that these conditions are bad, economically speaking, but the efficiency argument is the time that I'm spending trying to work through the system of bureaucracy and conditions, that's a waste. Okay? So if we could efficiently target those people who anyway are, are, are going to be poor, that would be fine. The problem is, as soon as you have conditions, people will spend time trying to, trying to uh, fulfill those conditions. Um, a sort of slightly different point is that if you're on uh, benefits, if you're on welfare and you start working, obviously your, your welfare is withdrawn. Right? There's the sort of welfare trap uh, problem. And so there's an argument <coughs> that uh, UBI might increase the incentives to participate in the labor market. Okay, so this is contrary to what most people intuitively think. Um, because they think you, work, you, you get more money, you work less. Well, actually, economists think that at least for participation, so the next slide, for participation, that's not necessarily the case, right? So there are increased incentives, actually, to take up work. Yeah, because if you take up work, if you start working a few hours, you no longer lose your benefits. Okay? Um, so this might increase employment. <coughs> uh, you might, however, spend more time looking for a good job rather than taking a bad job, which might, by lengthening the unemployment space, decrease employment. Uh, but then, of course, you've got the sort of standard, uh, what we call income effect, which is that you basically, because you're rich, you might buy some leisure rather than buying consumption. Okay? And so typically, you might expect that more people work, less unemployment, but people work fewer hours. It would be a, a standard expectation. Um, often, this is considered to be a very important idea, which is that the jobs might get better, because people are no longer forced to work. So people can choose jobs that they actually enjoy which, again, is, is, is something which will then lead to very different employment effects, right? We might expect certain jobs to become less sought after and others to become more sought after. So the gross unemployment effects are, are, are unclear. And why, why, it's not only because I'm interested in labor economics that I'm discussing this so long, but, I mean, how many hours are worked in an economy at le is at least currently the way we're collecting um, taxes it's going to be very important to, you know, how much will this thing cost, okay? If the number of hours worked in Germany reduces by 10, 20 percent, there's going to be huge problems for the, for, for the fiscal system, okay? I mean, you can then start thinking of other ways, but to just say, you know, we've got 40 million households or we've got 80 min million individuals, we have to pay them all 1,000 euros, given taxes is one thing, but taxes are going to change, right? And what I'm saying is it's not clear how they're going to change. 
Um, and it's not obvious how you create a system where you know how they're going to change. So we could obviously have a different tax base, we could tax different things, and I'll go into that in a second, but if the system is anything like it is now, we all know if unemployment rises, um, the government has problems balancing the budget. And if, as now, there's a fairly high growth rate, unemployment is very low, uh, the, you know, the, the government has a, has a good fiscal position. Sure, no, no, ask now, sorry, shoot. Um, in general, like, isn't UBI also good kind of for unemployment to go down because people wouldn't not need to work? So, or, or put another way, um, should we not try to find a way where less employment is built into the system anyway because of automation and all these kind of things kind of make work without fewer people working? Sure. I'm just saying, like, this is probably an important part anyway, right? Make UBI work in a way that it allows for fewer people working. That, that, that was at least, like, my understanding, of, like, as one of the strong arguments for it. It kind of supports... That, that it allows to redistribute resources without uh, people having to work. Yeah, so I mean, we've got trend productivity increases. So potentially, you know, we could all work less if we if we didn't increase our consumption. Um, and then you get to the question of redistribution. So if you want, if you've got trend productivity increase, um, and you're reducing the number of people working, taxes have to be continually increasing. Uh, not obvious that people will accept that. Okay, so then you're then you're continuously increasing the amount of redistribution, because the people who are working are are, are producing more, because of automation. Um, but it's it's never going to be the robot producing by itself, right? There's always going to be someone who's. You're not necessarily increasing redistribution. So if if your tax base goes down then basically the redistribution goes also down, so you basically just bring it back up to some level. Isn't that the case? I mean... We have now given level of, of, of uh, employment pay work and, and level of taxes on different things. I mean, other things to take into account that, of course, it's not just labor that you can tax on. Uh, Oh yeah, no, sure. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of forms of taxation that you can sure. increase uh, to, to to finance if your tax base. Sure. Well, I'll I'll uh, mention a few. Goes down later on. And uh, therefore, I think that the question whether you have to increase redistribution to be able to to finance basic income or not is not directly connected uh, to the question of how much. Uh, how much, uh, yeah, labor is uh, tax, labor income is yeah. taxed. No, I agree. Uh, the, the point I'm making is, at the moment, it's, it's very linked, right? I mean, the taxes on labor are up very high. So around about 50% of what the employer pays to a worker goes to Social Security contributions and taxes. You know, we can find that a good system or a bad system. It's the way the system works now. Now, what I'm saying is if, if we were to give people a basic income and, and just pay transfer of, say, 1,000 euros to everyone's account, the effect that that would have on employment is going to be really important for the fiscal cost. If people continue working, which is what <laughs> lots of the calculations assume, if con people continue the same amount of hours worked in Germany, that's one thing. If hours go down or go up, as I'm arguing, they might also go up things might be quite different. Um, and a second point which is also related is firms' reaction is often neglected. It's not the case that wages are somehow fixed. Exogen wages are not directly just a function of productivity or something. They're negotiated. Firms set wages basically because they want 
workers to come and work in their firm. If you ask a standard, uh, standard uh, CEO, they say, we pay competitive wages. What does that mean? Well, they pay whatever they need to pay in competition with other firms to get a worker to come. Uh, if there's no negotiated uh, system with the unions. So, you know, usually, often we, we neglect that as economists if there's a small change, which affects a small part of the population. So we, we look at the effect of, we then only consider labor supply when we say, okay, we've changed the maternity leave system or something. It only affects pregnant women or women who've had ch children. We're not going to say that firms discriminate against them, so we say wages are fixed. But with UBI, this is because it's by definition everyone, it's very unlikely. So firms are going to react. They're going to react because potentially more people are looking for a job. Right? As, as we argued earlier, more people will, might accept a job because they're on, you know, they're on benefits. They don't have necessarily a, um, an education where they get a high paid job but now they can, they can easily uh, make a few euros on top of their uh, welfare. So potentially there's more people looking. People were looking for different uh, jobs. And if, as we argue, wages are now less important, maybe pay lower wages, right? Um, so this is something which one of the proponents of, of UBI in Germany, for example, mentioned, right? He said he expected lower wages, the, the chief of, of DM, Götz Werner, yeah? But wouldn't it be the case that also people would be more, uh, less willing to accept this, uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, bad yeah. jobs or uh, yeah, very uh, consuming uh, jobs? Um, so that would increase maybe the wages? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, there's a, you're quite right. So there's a, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you would probably want to be compensated more for whatever you dislike. Right. But if you like a job, to have I got the, so there's a, oops. Uh, no. Uh, it's driving me slightly mad, this thing. Um, so this is the workers page down. Uh, I haven't, yeah. Oh, so I used to have on here the living wage argument. So I mean, in, you probably know in, in England, especially in London, there's a big debate about the living wage. And it's a very strong argument to say, look, we can't live off these wages. We need wages to be higher. Not a, it's an argument which isn't related to productivity, which isn't related to how much people like the job or anything. It's, it's n it can't be right for someone to do a job full time and them not being able to live off it. This is an argument which was very powerful. Um, and, and I mean, the $15 per hour in the US is, has, you know, has had a similar impact, especially in areas in, in the West Coast, and et cetera, where living is very expensive, where living costs are high. Um, what I'm saying is this argument doesn't apply anymore, right? If you've got a UBI, and if it is actually enough to live off, no need to pay a living wage, right? So. You know, people might, of course, people have the possibility also of not taking it now, but firms also don't need to pay it. So I'm, I'm not sure how it's going to pay out, right? Mm -hmm. I, I suspect that it, it, wages will be more differentiated according to desirability of the job, but it's, it's, it's not obvious to me that wages will be higher. Yes, in a city like Berlin, you may not have a problem. But if you live in a small town and the, where the next town next to you is a 60 kilometer away, so you already lived your life, it's hard for you to get a job and hard for you to reject the job. So th that's the reality. So in that case, the only option would be that you have your minimum wage and you be I together, then you standard your life. Because without the minimum wage, if the company can pay way less, what will happen as a result is that yes, you get the 1,000 euro maybe from the UBI, and you get a very little money from work you do, but you still have to work so much to live off it. So yeah. the only argument for it would be that, yes, you have the UBI, you have your minimum wage, now you have a quality life. You can say, okay, I don't work 40 hours, but maybe 20 hours. 
so I can fix my chart as well. Okay, so 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 y you're saying? I think without the minimum wage, UBI will not be so much affected. Okay. You will end up in the same. Okay. Same as okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I see what you're saying. With half the with half the hours work. <laughs> No, the, the company simply say, I can pay less than what I'm supposed to pay because you're already receiving money. The company will pay less than what they're supposed to pay. The company will be in a similar sorry, <laughs> problem in the middle of nowhere, your having to find employees. No? Your assumption is that sorry. Sorry. people then <laughs> don't have the option to look for a different job. Yes. yes. So the negotiation is going to be different. And I mean, we all know, in practice, these things are negotiated. Right. I mean, the minimum wage was negotiated. It was the realization by the trade unions that it wasn't the system wasn't working. Wages were extremely low in some uh, areas, in some sectors in Germany, and then they pressurized the government to, to implement a minimum wage. Would they have the same negotiation power if there is a min if there is a basic income? I don't know. I, I suspect things might might be different. This might be considered the thing to redistribute towards low-income individuals and the minimum wage maybe not. So, so again, this, this might explain why some people, some capitalists are in favor of the minimum income, right? Because you don't have the same fight of redistribution between capitalists and workers. Now we've got a different state system which might sort of remove some of the pressure on firms to pay people decently. <coughs> Is there much like thought given to the incentive to unionize in the presence of UBR? So, for instance, in our shitty town over here with the undesirable one firm and all the people are getting screwed by the firm, all these people conceivably have a living wage. That's what UBI is supposed to be, right? So what stops these people from literally saying, fuck you, to that company and we're not going to work for you? All those people live in the town. They're the only people living in town. <coughs> They're incentivized to union in this thought experiment. They'll actually crush the, the firm under the fact that they don't want to work. And so my question is, is there much thought paid to this idea of unions in the presence of UBI? Not just to this argument. I'd, I've only got this one slide. U trade unions have been pretty uniformly hostile towards UBI. I think this has got several reasons. The one is, here is the living wage argument. The one thing is that they fear, I think, that wages go down. The other is a more, slightly more meta aspect, which is lots of the proponents of UBI want paid employment to be less important in society. Unions live off the fact that paid employment is important. Um, this sort of trend decline in, in unionization, I think, is not entirely unrelated to the fact that jobs are becoming more precarious, that lifetime jobs are, are less frequent. Mm -hmm. And basically, the people in this small village are very dependent on the firm not taking their capital out, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, they could unionize, but yes, the firm can also take their capital and put it elsewhere. I mean, the fact that capital is, is more mobile than workers, I think, has been one of the big uh, determinants of, of you know, the issues that workers have been facing over the last um, 30, 40 years. So I, th I think unions are, are right to be concerned, basically. Um, And at the same time, it's, you know, we might still favor UBI because we think that the current system is rewarding people who are in work uh, too much compared to people who are out of work, maybe not to their own fault, and maybe because they're doing very valuable work. But if we want to consider it in terms of sort of insiders and outsiders, then trade unions are more with the insiders and uh, the UBI is potentially favoring the outsiders but might also create problems for, for some workers for whom the unions might be very important. So th these are definitely things to consider. Um, 
I, I think it, it, it's very interesting to, it will be very interesting to talk to unions about this. They, I've only found negative uh, statements on, of unions on this, but I know that they're, they're looking into it as well. I mean, the, the minimum wage in Germany was already a, a sign of failure of the unions, right? I mean, they, they wanted to have the negotiation power and they had to concede that they couldn't negotiate proper wages, that unionization rates were too low in certain sectors, especially in East Germany. Uh, and they called for the state, right? So again, this is another system of redistribution towards, which in effect is going to benefit low-income individuals, which again is the state rather than the workers together. So I'm, I, I think unions are, I don't know whether they might benefit from it, but it's definitely, it will be taken as a sign of, of weakness, I think, the UBI. They're going to try and argue that we need more jobs <clears throat> and we need higher wages. Um, okay, so as I, as I said, I think I mean, this is the key argument against the basic income, right? It's, we can't realize it. It's too expensive. Now, all what we said earlier indicates that it's extremely difficult to come up with a figure. Basically, I, don't, I haven't seen any figure which I think is vaguely credible. Not that the calculations are bad. It's just that the assumptions you need to make are very strong. Um, basically, if you pay a basic income which is low enough that people don't change their behavior, then you can calculate something, a figure. But that's not the point, right? The point is that people are enabled to do things differently. If you enable people to do things differently, they might do things differently. If they do things differently, the tax base is going to change a lot, right? So it's not just a question of what you pay out, it's a question of how much you're getting in. And, and, and I think that that's really a, a major problem for implementing this thing soon, because politicians are going to be very wary of proposing and fighting for a system where they don't know what's going to happen. No, I think that's a very good uh, intuition, and that, that actually that's how I'm going to conclude. I don't think that saying the policy is going to be taken back is very attractive, because I mean, the idea is to, to see how people adjust if they believe that it's, you know, it's credible in the long run. Right? I mean, <laughs> 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 Nobody would notice. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm saying you wouldn't have to tell them in advance that you might take it back. Just, the uh, camera's on, though. <laughs> I think you're raising an important issue. I think this is really an important issue. I think a policy which might go wrong big time is not something which is easily proposed. That, that's, I'm going to conclude that it makes sense to think of you know, restricted groups or um, you know, paying it for a restricted amount of time. But I mean, we want people to be able to rely on, on, on the system, right? Because we want people to you know, to change, to, to, to t you know, make use of the freedom that this, this system is supposed to offer. So if there's a fear that the system is going to go, go wrong, then people might cling to their jobs and say, you know, basically, if people are unsure, you can save money, you can't save freedom, right? So if you're worried of tomorrow, you're always going to work more.
only saying you might take it back and also not seriously considering it as an option, but rather like you know having it in the back of the mind as a legislator, like it might not work out and we might have to have a plan B in case it doesn't. Uh, that, that's, that's, I think, yeah. more than a piece. Isn't that one of the benefits of having it as a complementary currency? Like when we're talking about this uh, blockchain-based based income, if a government was to bring in a digital-based complementary currency that represented the basic income, they could track it very accurately and they could actually withdraw it over time because mm -hmm. it's a separate currency. If it's, you know, if it's in a way, and this is probably quite complicated macroeconomics, this, this famous thing, Gresham's Law, bad money drives out good. Mm. If you brought in a basic income and it devalued the currency, you might be in a bad situation if it was denominated in euros. Mm. If it's denominated in it's earth, other currency that you say is worth euros, and also maybe has a time limit, so that you have to spend it within a month or else it's worth mm. nothing. You can have a very easy phase out. You can go, okay, well, we're getting a lot of inflation, so we have to turn down the tap, you know? And, I think that's one of the benefits of having a different monetary system for paying the basic income. I think uh, there is another option, um, which is, I think act has actually happened. So if you define basic income in terms of a negative uh, income tax, mm. and then, well, you play, can play around with, with the rates like with any other tax rate, yeah, and you can say, okay, so it's so it's, if you don't view basic income with the with the condition that it needs to be uh, uh, it, it needs to be uh, it needs to guarantee a substance subsistence level, mm -hmm. uh, but you, you just introduce it for example as a partial basic income first, then you can of course play around uh, with the levels first and then see uh, what's the impact and, and then slowly get there. But in the US that actually exists uh, to, to some terms and they, they have been actually changing the, the levels uh, there. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so if we want to think about you know how high how high do we want the UBI to be or uh, as you probably know what's been banded around what I've heard are sort of fairly reasonable figures somewhere between 400 euros which is basically the, the sort of minimum that, that exists now uh, and I don't know, 1,500 or something which is somewhere more like median income. Um, now the point I'd like to make is that the current welfare payments can be much higher than that if, you, if you're disabled they can be a lot higher if you're, um, you're a lone parent taking care of a few kids, they can be much higher. If we, don't, if we don't want to cut welfare payments to individuals who have these high needs, then either we need to have, we still need to have a bureaucracy which considers individual needs, which often so lots of the UBI calculations, they basically get rid of the whole social security system and all the bureaucracy. Um, I don't think that's at all realistic. I think you, you'll always need to have some kind of people looking at, looking at individual cases for people who have you know, special needs uh, if you don't want to cut uh, welfare payments to certain individuals. Alternatively, you have a very high UBI, which then might have even stronger behavioral reactions. And so I think the, the, the level is sort of brings qualitative differences as well. It's, it's not just a matter of how much makes sense. Its needs vary and the UBI is, if it's the same for everyone, it's going to be a, you know, above or below welfare payments that these individuals would get. So in the concept of UBI, and I'm kind of new, uh, is there any like change with the location that you're in and the, the, like the environment that you're in? Because obviously, like someone in New York doesn't need the same as someone in Montana or Nevada or something. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like it would like, it could be <coughs> totally oscillate depending on, on, on where you are to begin with. <coughs> yeah. 
the systems I've heard of, they don't, they don't vary. What you have is you have UBI uh, for children as well. Yeah. What I've heard is different rates for kids, which, which helps quite a lot actually if you consider current payments. If the example of the lone parent. If, you've, if you're a, a lone parent and you've got two or three kids and you get UBI for them, even if it's a different level, that, that someone takes care of that. But regional differences, I think lots of countries have prof problems with regional differences. <laughs> it's, it's considered unfair. I mean, say that the minimum wage in, in many countries is the same, although you know, uh, conditions vary a lot. In the US, not, but in England, France, Germany, minimum wages are the same, although differences in living, living uh, price of cost of living is, is very large. There's like a flat minimum wage, and it doesn't vary by province or, or no. city or whatever. No. In Germany, it's 850. In Munich and in Bautzen. <laughs> so um, presume, I presume the same kinds of arguments are going to be raised against regional differences. I, I once read a proposal, a, a French proposal, to pay out UBI in regional currencies, regional side currencies in French regions, for example, thereby you would be able to differentiate how much you would get, but it would be paid out in a, to support the local economy, and therefore you would make, make sure that there's less of a money drain on the local economy by centralized firms. But then how you define the rate? I mean, it's, it's, it's not very you developed. Get to the same I'm, I'm problem. not sure you I'm very to, happy You have to that. make a decision in this regional currency, the level is that much, and the Would, other Wouldn't it be based on, like, commodities, like the cost of, you know, what it takes to live there? I mean... Well, you, you know, and that's usually how inflation is calculated, and that's a mess in, in Germany always also, because it's very difficult to calculate what actually a person's needs are. I mean, sorry. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, this, the the the. Cost of milk. Cost of Yeah, but you need a car, for example. I mean, so how high do you factor in petrol? It's easier yeah. to calculate according to like uh, poverty level or something mm. like this, which is defined in like sixty percent of the median wage you catch, which you can then of course apply regionally. I mean, you get this whole discussion if you talk about uh, UBI on a European level, for example. You don't even have to go to the global level. Eh? Mm -hmm. yeah. But, I mean, we have a basic uh, poverty level of uh, Romania and probably 7,500 in Finland. So, mm -hmm. it, uh, of course, this is quite... Uh, will, we, will we discuss that after or will that be finished? Okay. Not at all. Just I take that as a sign. We'll do more Q&A Q &A at the end. <laughs> Uh, and it's not, not, not far now, anyway. Um, okay, so we, we, we sort of discussed this uh, already. So if we did it now, if we just implemented the UBI, then as, as I said, a lot of, I mean, I'm simplifying big time here, but a lot of the state's uh, fiscal revenues come from labor taxes. VAT is not that different if you think about it. Um, um, because? because because the two thirds of of people's income which they spend on stuff comes from uh, comes from labor income. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sorry, VAT is value added tax. It's what you if you buy something in a shop they add on twenty five percent in Germany. Um, now most of what people spend, most of the money that people spend, they get as income. So whether you increase income taxes or VAT, it's got a different effect because income taxes are progressive, uh, whereas VAT is proportional. It's the same for everyone. Um, but of course, and there's also capital income, right? So capitalists pay VAT, but it's, it's, it's a different tax. But if you think of income taxes, most of it is, 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 is coming from the amount of hours work. That's, that's why I... I think that this labor economics dimension is, is, is quite relevant. And that's what, as you know, people sort of talk about is, do, will people stop working and we, will, will be, we become a poor country? <laughs> because people will all become lazy and live off the commons. Um, 
So there's lots of margins. The fiscal consequences are, 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 not, are not clear and depend to a significant extent on the change in hours worked. And I think serious calculations are extremely difficult. I mean, these have been done. They use so-called labor supply elasticities, how much people change working when wages change. But we don't know how wages change. What we're changing here is, is wealth, basically, and, and how much people change, how much they work as a function of wealth. There is some evidence on that, people winning in the lottery, how do they change their behavior. But it's different if everyone gets it. Okay? So prices, for example, I mean, again, there's, if we give everyone money, some people will say, well, prices will just rise. I mean, if you think of, say, house prices or so, there's definitely a question of just, you know, it's, it's, it's just distributing who has the most. Uh, they get the best flat. And then the amount of money you have to pay to get the best flat depends on how much uh, revenue overall there is. For other things, that's not the case, right? For other things, you can produce more or less. Um, <clears throat> but so I, I think it's, it's very difficult for the kinds of UBI that are proposed. I, I, I've, I would say it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, so this is what's been mentioned also. So in Alaska, for example, basically the oil revenues in Alaska, they're not like the Norwegians who build up a big fund. In Alaska, they, um, without any populism, they, uh, they just distribute a, a check to everyone. So in some years, it's, it's around, the dimension is around about, in some years, it's something like $500, and in another year, it's maybe $2,000 or so. It doesn't change their behavior, and it's once a year, and it's not fixed, so you can't rely on it. But it's not trivial either, especially if you think of Alaska's not that small. Some people live there. In some, it's a lot of money. Um, and there's a lot of natural resources in Germany which are being exploited, and we might tax them, and if we use them more efficiently, that might be a good thing. So that might be a sort of win-win outcome of taxes. So these kinds of environmental taxes are, are popular among economists because people are, are pushed in the right directions. But of course, you know, at the end of the day, Someone's paying, right? Uh, and so it's not obvious that this is going to be particularly as progressive, for example, as income taxes. I, I don't know. I think it's very difficult. There have been some calculations. You know, obviously, the rich fly more. They use more resources. But compared to how much income tax they're paying, not obvious. So um, again, it's, it's not clear what the net outcome would be if you think of it as redistribution. Um, so, so again, so that's where maybe you come in, right? If you think of, and I think, I think that's something for you to consider is abstracting from how the money system actually works. At the end of the day, who's going to provide the resources which other people are going to use? If you think of it as from a sort of real perspective, some people, the, the, the consumption of goods and services is going to somehow change. And who's going to benefit from that and who's going to pay for it more? I think that's an, an interesting, yeah, an important thing to consider and to try and argue that it's not going to actually be, you know, regressive and it's going to be the poor who are going to have to contribute more somehow. Um, <clears throat> so this comes to the fairness points. So there's some moral justifications for paying everyone a lump sum for the amount of money. You've probably heard of some of these. <clears throat> so I'm a labor economist. We believe that there's lots of problems in the labor market. It's not like a market. You don't go into a supermarket and buy a job. You have to search. You might be lucky. You might be unlucky. There's all sorts of reasons why some people clearly would like a job. If you tell your mates, oh, I've got a new job, they're going to go, oh, great. Right? If you say, I bought a new car, they might also say, oh, great. But if you say you bought a carton of milk, they're not going to say, oh, great. Right? So people consider it somehow having a job is, is good luck. So giving people 
uh, money because they're looking for a job is something which is you know, morally quite easily justifiable. Again, for all these different non-market activities, <coughs> conditional on people doing these things, it makes perfect sense to give people uh, money. Um, there's a different, slightly different argument <coughs> if you consider people transiting from welfare into work. So currently, if you're on welfare and you start a job, some of the welfare is, is reduced, right? So you're on welfare, you get your 370 euros, you get your money for your uh, rent. Now you start a job, you should be getting 1,000, whatever, 500 euros more per month, but you don't because the state says, actually, we're not paying your rent anymore, and we're not paying your your Isle your 370 euros, right? So you actually don't get the 1,500 euros which you're working for. <laughs> okay, so that's a different sort of way of arguing against the high marginal tax rates, which um, the current system implies. Um, so workers should deserve all the income that they get, all the additional income. A slightly libertarian argument. Um, so th this is the sort of philosophical idea of automation dividend. I think that's yeah, it's it's not so easy to um, yeah. I'm I'm I think it's it's slightly more difficult because people do think of contemporaneous distribution of resources. They don't think there's no stock of wealth which is sort of sitting there. Um, I guess you could make it somehow intuitive, but it, it's not intuitive to me why uh, every year we should, have, we should distribute resources on an egalitarian basis to everyone, um, just because in the past there's been uh, innovation and, and progress. But maybe there is a, a way of selling it which makes sense. Um, so obviously these... Actually, all, all the first three would, you know, are arguments for providing resources to people, but conditionally on something, right? Conditional on, you know, seeking a job, on doing something which someone considers valuable, <laughs> uh, on working. And so, so this, is, this kind of argument is, is really something which one, one can push. <clears throat> now, the things which... I've mentioned that the UBI is a little bit needs blind, which makes it simple, which makes it attractive. But from a sort of humanist perspective of emancipation and freedom, people need very different amounts. And, and ignoring individual needs is not necessarily the way to actually get people to be free. Um, a very strong argument is going to be in the populist press is going to be that the working people are subsidizing the lazy. Uh, I think this is this is this is this is the serious uh, counter argument which which you would have to deal with. And so some of the proponents of what they call UBI have proposed sort of some kind of conditions on activity is basically some kind of saying you do something sensible. And again, how you define that, you could see. Is it going to be less bureaucratic than the current system? Who knows? But uh, I think something like an active citizen's income is going to be much more, uh, is going to have much wider, easy, much more easily digestible for lots of people than the idea that because of the past progress, everyone should get money. Um, one final issue is going to be, if you pay on an individual basis, you're going to be paying people, I mean, I guess this, and, we, and then we stop it if it goes wrong. I think it would be interesting to think about something like UBI for senior citizens. So we have got a problem of people haven't paid enough into the pension system. Um, all sorts of issues related to the, the current way that works. 
Uh, I mean, this is being talked about, but obviously not along the lines of UBI. <coughs> We've got a similar issue for young adults. So as some of you probably know, in Germany, the parents get money for their kids. And if, their kids, if kids are in, uh, in school or university, parents get this money until kids are 25 or something. For education, university education, why not let people do whatever they want? If you limit that to the age of 25, whatever, you avoid some of the risks that people say, you know, I'm going to be lazy forever. It's clear, you know, it's, it's like you should, you should use it to invest in yourself because afterwards it's going to go away. You know, again, senior citizens, you don't have some of these incentive questions, let's say, because people are no longer working or not working very much. You could have systems of sabbaticals where you say every individual is allowed to have one or two or five years of UBI and that would limit the costs of it and then see what people do with their sabbaticals. Of course, people might do different things if it's shorter, but I, you know, I think this would be an interesting kind of proposal which you might get through. Um, an issue in Germany for people who want to, say, start a new firm or just take time off is health insurance is really complicated, okay? So there's ways in which the social security contributions make life difficult for you if you're not in employment, which could be avoided, okay? So there is universal health care in Germany, as you probably know, but if you're not employed, it's difficult. If you have to sign up and you pay something like, I don't know, two, three hundred euros per month, um, which then if you know, there's some kind of form of means testing where you somehow get it back, uh, potentially, but it's complicated. And it doesn't incite people to take a year off or to, to start a new business, etc. So this, yeah, it's not UBI, but it's something which in practice actually might prevent the kinds of things which you want to encourage with UBI. And then there's all these experiments which have been widely reported. They're all fairly limited. I mean, the press are often very enthusiastic standard of living uh, and then see what they do that I haven't I haven't seen any examples so that's all I've got Is it? yes <laughs> question to start um, because we got on to that um, do you think living wage as a concept makes any sense I don't first of all <laughs> because it's trying to make two things meet you know like it, in London for example you've got rising costs of, of, of living and that's a much bigger problem than how much can an employer pay somebody and so if you get in a situation where you're saying every employer has to pay enough to live there, you end up with a, a possibly a cycle that continues forever. And the employers just won't, I just don't feel that they'll do that. If that's significantly above what they feel the market should be paying for their employees, they'll figure out ways that they don't have to pay it, whether it's moving from you know, London into a cheaper city or something like that. I mean, do you think, like at least, let me frame the question this way. Isn't is there a significant amount of econo economists that think that's just too much of that would warp the labour market too much? Not that I know of. I mean, I think I, I think if, as an employer, you are asking someone to work for you for forty hours a week, you've got to pay them enough so that they can pay their bills and, you know, live a decent life. I think, otherwise, you shouldn't employ them. And, and what would you say about then you've got businesses that are important for people to live their lives but aren't state businesses? So if, if they were to, you know, I'm not sure about the situation in German cities, but I know in London if they were to mandate a living wage, a lot of businesses would have to leave London. So those services, they might not seem directly important to live people's lives, but things like bakeries have to pay people more money, 
therefore less bread, therefore bread costs more money. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the, big, the, the big issues in, in, in London and in many, uh, in many of these sort of global cities has been, has been increasing inequality. So you've got a, a, a class which is earning a lot of money, and it's not just capitalists, it's they're earning income, high incomes, and you've got uh, people who are earning very low incomes. As economists, we think that in the very long run, you know, you, there's, there's lots of different things you can do. In the short run, options are more limited. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the housing market is clearly a major factor in this, but this, this goes beyond this talk. But um, I can see what you're saying, but at the same time, it doesn't seem a solution to say people should be paid below what <laughs> what they can live off, right? Mm. I mean, um, lots of the employers of people below the minimum wage make a lot of profits. Not maybe the bakeries, but mm. lots of other people. Um, but I, I think that's a, a, sli a slightly, a slightly different, different issue. I, d I don't think... I mean, the UBI is an answer to, is one way of organizing redistribution. The living wage is another. Like in a place like London, unemployment is not a huge issue. So at the end of the day, the two address the same problem. Because you've got most people who would benefit from UBI are people who are working. The additional aspects that UBI would address would be the kinds of work that people are doing. Um, I would, and you may not, you may not know this, know this, and that's fine. But um, is there any consensus as to how uh, a like traditional UBI, not like the limited, silly UBI, but like full-on UBI, how this would affect uh, lending, like uh, for? Business, small bu for small businesses, small business loans and mortgages and things like that. Wow, <laughs> no idea, no clue. Sorry. What's your, what's your intuition or why are you? No, I don't have intuition. That's why I'm asking. No, because I, I no, because I'm curious. Because if you have like, okay, in Spain, you if you're unemployed, you get a payment, you know, for like up to eight months or however long you're working before. But then uh, they implemented a system for a little while. I don't know if it's still going where you could get all your payments in a lump sum up to 10 months to start a business or something like this. Oh, okay. You know, so, you know, if, if there was a program like this, maybe banks would be less likely to lend because you could get it from somewhere else. But then I, ju I just wonder how UBI would affect risk for entrepreneurs. Could you make it sound like, oh, you'd have income, you could do whatever you want, but you can't really start a business with 1,200 euros a month. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the business, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got somebody at the back as well. If you want, uh, yeah, just because we all get around to them all good. Yeah, yeah John. Uh, yeah, um, thank you very much for your talk this evening. It was a good time. And um, when I came to start looking, researching into the economic effects or like the economics behind the basic income, your paper was one of the first papers to come out. And it's a really good launch. And there are nine pages, so it's really concise, which for a policy paper is amazing. Um, I would like to make a comment, if I may, and then ask a question. Uh, the first was to come back to the, the idea of like uh, regional differentiation, and there there are possibilities to use something like like new mechanisms like or like measures like purchasing power. UBI increases labor mobility, so at the moment we have a lot of capital mobility, but we have very little in terms of labor mobility. So if you want a really fair free market, you need to have. I mean, one thing you'll never have is free.
as well as going from small towns to the larger towns, you might also have people who are finding it so trapped in London or in New York because that's where employment is. And you have to be there when you're like starting out and when you're doing your internships, your practicums, and you're doing your low wage work there. But actually, maybe now you can say, like, actually, I'm going to do this in, in a small town somewhere in the middle of the ocean. So, in terms of like the event, like, it, it depends on what sort of society you want, and then having that idea, you can then start to work back. So, I mean, there are effects both ways. Um, financing models or mechanisms. You mentioned like a lot of the critique of, of basic income comes down like it's based on models of income taxes, whether flat or progressive, or sometimes consumption and sales taxes. And then you also mentioned uh, environmental taxes. But um, what did you in your research did you come across some of the more like and, and picking up on the idea of automation? Automation is the idea that returns productivity move towards uh, capital and away from labor. And our tax system is heavily dependent on labor or income taxes. Do you, what, what is, what is real, real, how practical would it be to base in a UBI on something like a financial transaction tax or capital or higher capital gains taxes? maybe even something like land value added taxes. I mean, are they realistic? Um, <clears throat> they're realistic, yeah. I mean, economists usually consider taxes under the paradigm that at the end of the day, individuals are the ones who receive all the value of production. Okay, so whether it's capital or whether it's labor, at the end of the day, someone's going to, on their tax sheet, is going to have the money. So, you know, we can tax corporations, but what changes is it's the capitalists, they get less income. So you could also tax the income. Now, in, in practice, you know, taxing corporations or taxing income from capital is different because, for example, if Germany taxes German corporations, German corporations are overwhelmingly owned uh, abroad by foreigners. So, you know, it does have differences, but on a, on a more global level, uh, at the end of the day, the question is, how do we want to tax different individuals according to where they get their revenue from? And so, at the moment, in Germany, for example, the people who get money from capital at the moment are taxed very low, because you've got this 25% special rule, which was implemented basically because the finance minister at the time said, you know, 25% of something is better than <laughs> income tax or nothing, because there was all this uh, capital, you know, people were basically not declaring their income from capital because it's so easy to put it on a Swiss bank account. Now that's changed somewhat and um, I think there's going to be a shift towards higher income, uh, higher taxes on, on capital, uh, income from capital. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, this is the whole Piketty kind of argument, right? The argument is that uh, capitalists are taxed too little and that there's been a, a, a shift from that. But Next to this sort of functional thing, there's also, so functional being uh, capitalists versus workers, there's also been increasing inequality in earnings of people you know, who earn their money from labor. So I think, at least conceptually, it makes sense to think of these very simple notions. I mean, capital gains or land value tax, at the end of the day, someone's going to declare in their tax sheet, you know, this is what I earned, this is, these are the assets I have. Um, I think land value tax, well, economists love land value tax for lots of reasons, uh, but if we want to think about how we finance something, we've got to think about how do we tax uh, income from capital, how do we tax income from 
uh, from, from wages. There's not sort of, I don't think there's any magic or tricks. I mean, I think financial transaction tax is, is a good thing, but again, lots of the reasons why it's being suggested are not to raise revenue, right? I mean, it's, it's the kind of proposal which is being made for several reasons, and you can't find the right level to finance all these good things, also prevent too much speculation. I mean, lots of different things are, are, are intended to be done. But as, as Ed showed earlier, there's a lot of there's a lot of resources floating around in the world that are not being taxed. Um, I don't know whether I answered your question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, actually, I found it really interesting. I'd always have these different taxes in different boxes, and actually, what I took out of what you said is that in many ways we can think of them as being sort of a definitional issue rather than actually any underlying structural issue. So. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, all these. All the value of all these different assets, it's, it's value to humans, right? And humans, if they do, as they should declare them, it's, it's them that we're going to tax. We tax people. You know, we, ta we might notionally tax corporations, but what does that mean? It means that less resources go to the people who own these companies. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's a different way of organizing taxation, but at the end of the day, we're taxing, we're taxing people and we're, we're trying to make sure that it's somehow fair how, how different people contribute to society. Sorry, could I just make uh, one short question, uh, comment as well? Um, on your slide on fairness, you mentioned job seekers and carers, um, but just perhaps a very small recommendation from The Economist this month, which may not be the most sexy reading. <laughs> But they were talking about autism, and there was a study that they referred to that came out of South Korea that suggested that one in 38 people um, could, uh, could be diagnosed as being autistic. And we have an economic system that has a very particular idea of what it would be to be a productive human being, and these one in 38 autistic people don't necessarily fit that idea. And so we have a sort of unfair economic system, it's an economic system that not everybody can uh, relate to fairly. And so just a, a small, yeah, maybe on the fairness space, you mentioned job seekers and bad luck, but also, yeah, maybe also as well, health conditions. Mm -hmm. or, you, or the carers, but also the people being cared. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's, it's a very good that's a very good point. So I don't know who's. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, thanks for this excellent talk. I like that you, you know, put in the critical points. Also, mm -hmm. it's great. And I, I see how, how everything hinges on taxation. That it's possible to actually pay this out. And thanks for really asking about you know automation and the question of uh, how you would income and all this relates to. It. I'm wondering is whether it would make sense to. Uh, the use of <coughs> natural resources in some sense. The CO2 tax is a very limited way of that, but uh, I mean, an argument that you come across very often for a fairness argument for a basic income is that mm, production uses natural resources, which in a sense are a basic right to humanity or so, and they are very often not taxed. CO2 or land use or soil deprivation or whatever it is, minerals. Um, because, I mean, we, we have this problem of, of automation proceeding, it seems to me. And so the relative, um, basically, I mean, the, the human laborer is ever less important and the work being done by automation ever, ever more important. And so there's a, somehow a shift away from the traditional tax base whether or not we have a, a basic income. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting to discuss different, I mean, different tax bases have different advantages and disadvantages in form of, you know, how easy is it to collect it? Mm. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, another aspect is, you know, how efficient is it? How, 
how much loss is there because people do tax evasion or change their behavior. So that's a problem with, with uh, labor tax. Um, and there's a, big art, and there's a big discussion about how much do people not work because taxes are high. The consensus is basically, in most countries, uh, men in sort of typical working ages, they basically don't care how much they're taxed. Uh, for women, it's often different. They work less if taxes are higher. And, and then you consider, you know, that's not, a, that's not a good outcome because we don't want people to change their behavior. Now, if you have something like natural, oh, sorry. And then the third aspect is, you know, who's actually going to, in the, at the end of the day, pay for it. Um, now, for natural resources, let's assume, you know, you might have positive uh, changes in behavior because people use natural resources more carefully, which we might think is a good thing because it's got externalities of destroying the environment. Um, so we might think it's good if they're used more carefully. But at the end of the day, if you want to raise a certain amount of, of money, of resources, and then you're saying we're going to get this from you know, iron or extraction, then it's not going to be the companies producing this iron that are going to just say we're going to reduce our profits. They're going to change their prices. All the prices are going to change. They might have lower profits, but you know, the final goods prices will also change, which will mean that the purchasing power of your income changes. So who pays it at the end of the day? The, the final distributive impact of a tax is maybe quite different from who notionally pays it. So you might, you know, if you tax electricity or something, you know, it might be at the end of the day quite a regressive way of taxing it. Even though you want people to save electricity, if you know the electricity is a sort of good which happens to be used by everyone round about the same, then it's it's not it doesn't tax those people more who have more resources that they could use to further society. So this is I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying it's it's not easy to say, look here we can get it and it doesn't affect everyone. Most parts of production or most areas where things are produced along the value chain, let's call it, uh, it's going to affect every, everyone who participates in the chain. And it's, it's, a, it's a matter of negotiation and, and who's got the power in the system, <coughs> who can get, who ends up paying. So you had a question, I think. Well, I, I, well, um, well thanks a lot for the talk. I, been following the topic for a couple of years. I'm clearly not an expert on it, but I haven't seen it, you know, as straightly put as you've done it tonight. So that was that was really nice. Thank you. All the you know, points to be concise and, uh, and, and clear. Um, I was wondering um, if you have an intuition um, how much the concept of a uh, of the universal basic income is already mainstream. Because I, I remember I read an interview the other day, not so long ago, one two weeks ago, uh, in a pretty conservative. Uh, right-wing German newspaper, Die Welt, online. Um, and there was a, I think, pretty famous economics professor, I forgot the name, but uh, it was a pretty famous guy. Uh, I googled him uh, after I was reading the interview. Uh, and he was arguing for it, you know, like I didn't expect it. And I was wondering, do you have an intuition, like, you know, how close are we to having it partly at least, and maybe trying out one of those, you know, almost basic income grants that, that you mentioned? Or? I can take the German context. Yeah, the German context I know. Um, so, I mean, all economists know it because it's interesting <laughs> for, to an economist. <laughs> um, so, people know about it. In an academic context, it's it's been discussed. There's been several waves. It was discussed at one point somewhere in the mid '90s quite a lot. Uh, Althaus was uh, um, you know, chief of, was it Turing or something? And he, you know, he was in the Conservative Party and he sort of, he was for it and proposed it and so then people, you know, if, if there's some important proponents, they get some academics to do some calculations. Um, so there were some calculations at, at, at the time, end of the 90s. <coughs> As you probably also know, Gertz Werner pushes it, and he's got a forum, 
um, so he's the head of DM, this uh, chain of, of uh, pharmacists. Um, so I think it's it's known quite widely. What I think is 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 it's often not taken seriously. I think it's often considered a sort of slightly utopian idea. Um, and d politically, I know that there's people who are for it, at least in the Greens and in the left party. Um, there's considerable fractions, but neither of those parties actually have it on their platform. Actually, the Liberals, the FDP, they had it on their platform once, but they had some conditions attached. But it was fairly, they had it some beginning of the 2000s or so, and I'll have to have a look. So interestingly, different, very diff as a, across the different uh, political platforms, different parties have had it on their platform in, in more or less, well, actually, they, yeah, the Greens and the, the Die Linke, they haven't had it on their platforms, but they have Prominent, prominent people supported. So Katja Kipping, the, the head of, of Die Linke, and in, in the Greens there's a, a group which is very, quite influential. But I think they're worried. I think people are worried about the populist arguments against it. I don't think uh, mainstream politicians want to go out and say, "This is what we're proposing. Everyone should now get money." Um, because I think they're worried of a populist campaign saying <coughs> working people are now going to pay for the lazy. And I think that's why the trade unions aren't for it, amongst the other reasons I gave. And I think also that's why the Social Democrats is the one political party in Germany which I know where I don't know anyone who's ever been for it. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, yeah, it's striking that it's the conservatives and the left who've had proponents, but not the social democrats who are traditionally the party of the workers. So I think this idea of paid employment being de-valued de sort of is, is a big problem if you want to build support for it. So yeah, I don't just, know. Uh, just we'll wrap this up and try and finish by nine so everybody can get home. We've got 10 minutes and I think we have two questions. So do you want to go first, Daniel? Or no? I think one is up first. Yeah. Uh, basically, just an uh, extension. I mean, you mentioned the, the Greens, and I think just the multi of, of the, the so basic income conference organized by the German Greens uh, three days ago. And uh, there was a very interesting in, in introduction lecture by Opielka, mm -hmm. uh, who's been on, on the topic since I don't know, four decades or so. Uh, and uh, there was also this lecture by, by Paul Mencken, do you, do you know him, Berlin? Right. And, uh, and, and interestingly enough, they both uh, came together in this uh, idea of um, uh, that, that we have, that we are moving towards uh, an abundance-based economy. And uh, while our, our markets uh, uh, mechanisms but also, and there Opielka quoted actually Erich Fromm uh, from like what he wrote uh, like 60 years ago or even more, uh, saying that, that there is a kind of uh, moral or ethics of, of uh, scarcity and the moral of abundance. And, uh, and while we are more and more becoming an, an economy of, of abundance uh, where we need to generate artificial uh, needs uh, so that people consume more and more and more uh, our uh, our moral concept is still like uh, 100 years ago uh, of, of a society of, of, uh, of uh, scarcity yeah. and I think uh, to me I think that boils really down uh, while I mean you, you framed it in terms of, of populist a discourse, but I think that's that's really the, the the value system of most people is still based on on this notion that uh, resources are limited, and only of if you work, you know, to exploit those resources, which is I think very, very much a concept from really rural uh, agriculture-based uh, economy. Uh, 
so only if you contribute to to uh, generate more res I mean, or, or improve the resource use of, of uh, the society, then you are entitled to have an income. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the strategy must be somehow to, to move the discourse mm -hmm. towards uh, people realizing that this is not the case anymore. This is not how economy works. Yeah, I mean, just maybe just one one thought on that. I mean, <coughs> I, th I I mean, I think you're you're, you're right. There is the, what I call the populist thing is definitely a morality of scarcity. But I I do think that some of the proponents or some of the discourse comes from people who are definitely in the kinds of jobs which they would continue to do, and. It's not necessarily, you might somehow resent the idea of we're in an era of abundance if you're uh, on a low wage job being forced to do your work mm -hmm. and you clearly don't feel that you're in an era of abundance and you feel that you're actually working hard, other people aren't working hard and you then, you know, you might resent the Was feeling that you have to work and others don't. So. There was a very interesting uh, a poll uh, published in Der Spiegel some, some months ago, which they, they asked people, so if there was a basic income, what do you think, would people stop working? Mm -hmm. And like 80% or more said yes. <laughs> and then people were asked, okay, if there was a basic income, would you stop <laughs> working? And 80% of the pe people said no. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically very much this concept. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, laborers and all the rest are lazy. <laughs> so, um, how chic is UBI right now in terms of being a economics researcher? Like, if tomorrow or next year I wanted to do a PhD in economics and I wanted to focus on UBI, is that are we getting a lot of people to sort of look at this, or is this still sort of on the fringe? <laughs> um, so I mean, I should. One thing I should say is I, I wrote this policy uh, brief, and I'm I'm very glad uh, someone read it. <laughs> so it's good to hear. You never know. Um, but I, I haven't done a sort of academic academic work on it really. It's, it's policy work, and um, there has been Opjelka is one of the one of the people who's worked on this. Strengmann Kuhn, another guy from the Greens, who's also an economist, he's worked on it. But for the reasons I gave, I think it's difficult. And it's difficult to do empirical work on it. And what I mentioned earlier also, I mean, the, the kind of place I'm at, DIW is a sort of policy research institute. Most of it, the work we do is empirical. Most of it is more or less relate, more or less intended to be used somehow in the policy arena. Uh, in the policy arena, they want figures, they want numbers, um, and an idea which is philosophically inspired and nice and makes sense is only going to go so far. And for the reasons I gave, I think a UBI, which is ambitious in its level and scope, is is difficult. So I think, for example, you could there's lots of there's lots of theoretical work you could do in in economics. You know, I mean, there's there's theoretical economics is, is, a, is a big field. You can do very interesting, um, you know, in, in sort of the how does it play out in the labor market? You know, how does it affect wages? The kinds of questions I was I was discussing. I don't think they lots of questions haven't been looked at, but. Um, <coughs> so I think it's it's at the fr it's 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 very much a fringe issue because um, because it's difficult <laughs> basically is the answer because we don't know how people will react because basically we don't give people resources unconditionally ever we always attach conditions to it either work or the the social security system say you have to be in need and you have to prove that you're going to use it to search. So we don't know how people will react, which is part of the, you know, the charm of the thing, but also makes it hard to empirically work on it.
effects on labor supply or labor demand of introducing um, some form of social security provision because it will have have really large sample groups within an economy both are um, letting it have an effect. And this this must be true also for the new version of the original welfare state, which is presumably a problem that all sort of progressive ideas have and that somehow progressive ideas do come true yeah. and are championed. Yeah, but so for example the, the minimum wage um, I mean in Germany they were fairly ambitious and it was quite interesting that it got through but um, the economists said, you know, start with a low minimum wage and then see what happens. You can always increase it later. This is how it was done in England. It started very low, it covered few people, then there was a minimum sort of low pay commission, more or less independent, which suggested to the government how much they should increase the minimum wage. Now, the way UBI is typically discussed, and I think that's not a very clever way of discussing it, is typically discussed as it's got to be so high that you can live off it immediately. Uh, and then that immediately means it's very difficult to consider how, you know, I mean, there's even a low, a low UBI might have impacts that are positive. I mean, the, the impacts that it has don't seem to me to depend on everyone immediately being able to live off it. I mean, as you, you all probably know people in Berlin who <coughs> live off very little money, you know, then UBI with which I don't know three four hundred euros, it would still enable some people in some places to live off it, and free them of the need to engage in the market. Maybe that's a good. I don't know. Sorry, there was some. The slides. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put up the slides and I'll put up the paper and a few other things. Some of those news items. Um, I think that's. Is, is that the page? Yeah, okay. I'll email everybody. There's a Slack group as well. Okay. If you're interested in engaging more, it's it's all very at the moment it's all very volunteer based, you know what I mean? But as we build things, hopefully we'll get more engaged and we'll have several projects we will be working on. And then I might as well finish up because that seems like a good moment. It's coming up to nine. <laughs> Sorry guys, but everybody, thank you so much, Lou. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>